live button so let's wait for the stream to fire up all across the internet and we're going to be rocking on rolling on this lovely friday looks like we're almost live. I think we are now. We're ready to rock and roll, so let's get started. Hello, my friends, and welcome back to yet another episode of Watching the Watchers Live. My name is Robert Gruler. I am a criminal defense attorney here at the r, &R Law Group in the always beautiful and sunny Scottsdale, Arizona, where my team and I, over the course of many years, have represented thousands of good people facing criminal charges. And throughout our time in practice, we have seen a lot of problems with our justice system. I'm talking about misconduct involving the police. We have prosecutors behaving poorly. We have judges not particularly interested in a little thing called justice. And it all starts with the politicians, the people at the top, the ones who write the rules and pass the laws that they expect you and me to follow, but sometimes have a little bit of difficulty doing so themselves. And that's why we started this show called Watching the Watchers, so that together with your help, we can shine that big, beautiful spotlight of accountability and transparency back down upon our very system with the hope of finding justice. And we're grateful that you are here and with us today because we've got a lot to get to. It's a Friday, so we're going to have a little bit of fun, but we do have some business to attend to. And we're going to start by talking about uh, a protester who was arrested in 2020 as a result of the George Floyd incident. This guy is named Dylan Shakespeare Robinson. And so he just got sentenced. So, you know, almost a year ago, about 11 months ago, when he was involved in a lot of those protests that were taking place over the summer, there was a Minneapolis police precinct, the third precinct that burnt down. And, you know, we talked a lot about that precinct here on this channel because it's a big thing that happens, right? If it's a police department, if the entire precinct burns down, that's kind of a big deal. And so many of us were wondering, well, what's going to happen with these defendants who oftentimes, in my opinion, it's been looking like they've been getting a little bit of a lighter deal than some other defendants around the country. Of course, I'm talking about the Capitol Hill rioters. And so now this gentleman has been sentenced. And so we're going to talk about that. You know, it's kind of a kind of a, a, a stiff sentence, quite frankly. And I want to break down what happened there because we are going to sort of want to compare and contrast that with a lot of other defendants that have been arrested for these types of cases, in particular, public unrest, protesting, rioting, whatever you want to call it. We want to make sure that the scales of justice are even across the board. We'll see if that happens. Then we're going to change gears. We're going to talk about uh, the Washington, D.C. Attorney General is now offering to seal arrest records for some of those same protesters. So back, of, of course, during the summer protests, it's sort of the summer of unrest during the 2020 debacle of a year that was. There were a lot of arrests that were taking place as a result of the protest. And so the attorney general from Washington, D.C., guy by the name of Carl Racine, is now sending a letter out to people who were arrested saying, I'm going to go ahead and seal those records for you if you want. And so I have a copy of that letter that is being mailed out to defendants. I happen to love this idea. I think it's a great idea. I think the question is, is this going to be applied to other defendants, or is the same principle going to be extended to other jurisdictions, other offices in dealing with some of these political protest cases? So we've got a lot to talk about there. Then we're going to talk about Galen Maxwell. Galen Maxwell, we know, is uh, still in custody, tried to get out three times by requesting bail. Judges denied that multiple times. And a new photo just uh, was released yesterday through her attorneys of her in custody. And she's got a little bit of a bruise on her eye. And so, so people are sort of speculating, well, what's going on here? You know, was this a laceration? Was she hit? Is this something that is being induced because her body is you know, not functioning well? You know, you don't just sort of ordinarily develop bruising around your eye sockets. And so the fact that she has this little thing, you can see it right here. We're going to get to it, uh, of, of course, causes some concern. We want to make sure that she's healthy and well, because she is a pretty critical component of the government's investigation into what was going on with Jeffrey Epstein and the whole thing. So uh, a lot of going, a lot of stuff going on in the Maxwell case. Her attorney fired off another letter. We talked about this earlier in the week where there was uh, some, some back and forth about these confidential documents that the prison is alleging that the attorneys gave to Galen Maxwell during one of their meetings that they're saying Galen inappropriately took out of the prison cell. So a lot of back and forth. And now these accusations are flying around. The defense attorney is saying, wait a minute, are you accusing me of violating the prison laws? Oh! And the, the state's attorney is now responding. So we're going to get into that. And then we're going to finish up with a fun story. There's a woman out of Missouri who smuggled something in to prison that is, you know, it doesn't, doesn't often make it inside. So we're going to tell you what that is. So stick around till the end of the show for that. Now, as is usually the case, 
if you want to be a part of the broadcast, if you want to ask a question, leave a comment. If you've got some criticisms for me, that's okay. The place to do that is over at watchingthewatchers.locals.com. If you go over there and you decided to support the show, first and foremost, we would be uh, very appreciative of that. You know, of course, we're demonetized here on YouTube for the foreseeable future. And so if you want to support the show, that is really a great place to do it, watchingthewatchers.locals.com. But you'll notice over there, there's a live chat that's happening. And so if you have a question, Miss Faith is going to be clipping some of those questions, comments, criticisms, concerns, and adding those into the slides. We're going to go through all the three sections of the program today. And if you want a copy of the slides that we're about to go through, Again, that's available at watchingthewatchers.locals.com, along with a copy of my book and some other templates and some other fun things. But the real reason, amazing people are over there sharing links and having good conversations about very important things. So that's where you should be as well. So we're going to get into the news now. There is a George Floyd pro protester who just recently got sentenced. Uh, in fact, it was today, and we're, I'm talking specifically about Dylan Shakespeare Robinson out of Brainerd, Minnesota. If you recall back in 2020, there was a lot of protests taking place all around the country in Portland and Minneapolis and different areas. And there was one incident that involved a, a group of individuals sort of attacking the third precinct out of Minneapolis. And this was sort of right around the same time that Kamala Harris was posting on her Twitter account saying things like, uh, you know, we want to you know, sort of get these people out of custody. And there was this alignment from many people in this country uh, sort of to, to, to back a lot of this activity, you know, sort of these protests, this unrest was legitimate because it was addressing racial issues that have been you know, permeating throughout this country for a long period of time. And so some people were analyzing this saying, oh, well, I, I wonder, you know, what kind of penalties these protesters are going to get? Is it going to be the equivalent? You know, we have sentencing guidelines and we have federal standards and, and misdemeanor standards and, and state standards and all sorts of different rules. So we just wanted to see whether or not this what many people are characterizing as sort of a favored protest class, at least relative to maybe a disfavored class, which would be some people who are more on the right. Anybody who is supporting Trump is sort of lumped into this, you know, insurrectionist group, while this other group is sort of this peaceful protest. You know, CNN has the Chiron running. So, you know, uh, uh, mostly peaceful protest as there's smoldering flames behind them. Right? So there's sort of a a wrapping in bubble wrap on one demographic versus another. Anyways, long story short, Dylan Shakespeare Robinson is one of those individuals, 23 year old man sentenced to four years in prison. Now, what was his involvement? We're going to take a look at this in four years. That's a pretty hefty fine, right? For protesting or have hefty sentence. Then in addition to that, He's going to be looking at $12 million that he's going to have to pay back for the restitution as a result of what happened. So uh, this was a gentleman who was involved in apparently lighting a Molotov cocktail that was thrown at the third precinct that caught fire and then eventually ended up basically burning to the ground. So I want to go through this story just so we can sort of check in, see you know how this sentence feels, whether it's excessive or light. We're going to start by going over to the New York Times. It says here, the burning of the police station after George Floyd's death draws a four-year sentence. This was written over by Ozzy Paibara uh, two days ago, April 28th. Three days after George Floyd was killed in police custody in Minneapolis last year, the third precinct police building was set on fire. Thousands of protesters surrounded the building as it burned, sending giant orange flames and tall black clouds of smoke into the sky. So the whole the whole precinct got you know basically torched. And it was interesting because, you know, the, the, the reaction, I think, by the media is very different on these two things. Now, they are different. Capitol Hill riots, of course, that is a federal building that is the Capitol building of the country. It's a sacred building, but it is a government building, just like a police department is. And so, you know, you, you, you hear a lot of claims of insurrection and overthrowing American democracy for the Capitol building, but not when it's a police station or even a federal courthouse, as we saw in Portland. So I just want to point that out there for uh, those of you who don't already see it, which I'm sure you all do. So it says on Wednesday, 23 year old man was sentenced to four years and then two years of supervised release for his role in setting the fire. This is really what we want to sort of ask ourselves. You know, what was the role here? Was this a mastermind? Was this somebody who was there? Because we have also seen this same thing happen with the Capitol Hill rioters. There, there's been a, this tendency to charge people who were not even there. They were not even in the Capitol building. They're still being charged with crimes. We've covered several of them on this channel. They showed up the day after. They showed up that night after everything had already dissipated. But because they had some interaction with law enforcement, close in close proximity 
to the main event, as it were, then they were sort of rounded up in the dragnet that was taking place around D.C. at that time. The man, Dylan Shakespeare of Robinson, Brainerd, he's about about 120 miles north of Minneapolis. He's also ordered to pay 12 million bucks in restitution. You think a 23-year-old kid has $12 million? Probably not. He pled guilty in December to one count of conspiracy to commit arson. Three other men who also pled guilty uh, to participating in the burning of the police building will be sentenced at a later date. So there were three other people there, according to uh, Anders Folk, acting U.S. attorney out of uh, District of Minnesota. William Mozzie, the lawyer for Robinson, said he was disappointed at the sentence his client received considering the circumstances surrounding that fire. He said he is bearing the sentence for the other thousand people who participated. Mr. Mozzie said in an interview Wednesday night, many others far more culpable than Mr. Robinson, were not identified. He had no role in throwing any Molotov cocktails or constructing any or building any. Right? That, does, that doesn't sound okay to me. And, you know, if it, this is going to happen on or against people on the right, going to have an issue if this is happening with people on the left. Right now, this is his defense attorney. So, of course, you have to take this with a grain of salt. But on the on the sniff test, that passes, right? There were thousands of people around during the summer of unrest, the summer protests that were taking place there. And the government tends to do this. They just like to pick somebody and then make sure that they take the blame for everything, right? Rather than going out there and, and combing through all of those different protesters who were there when this happened back in May of last year or June, whenever it happened, they're not doing that, right? We, 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 they are doing that with the Capitol Hill rioters. You see the FBI every day. Who's this person? Who's this person? We need the public's help. Who's this guy in the red hat and the blue hat and the green hat? Help us find everybody. Did they do that on this one? Or are they just going to pick a couple defendants and say, well, we got a picture of this guy. So we're going to make sure that he sort of takes the blame. They pick somebody up as the scapegoat and they make sure that they can dogpile on that person. And I don't like when that happens to anybody, whether they're on the right or on the left, whether they are part of the MAGA group or part of the George Floyd protests. It is not okay either way. So let's go back. We have some more information. This comes over from TwinCities.com. It says, according to court documents, we want to look back on May 28th. Robinson, the person who was sentenced today, went to the third precinct where a crowd of hundreds gathered following the murder of Floyd. One point, the crowd began shouting, burn it down, burn it down. Soon after, a fence designed to keep trespassers out of the third precinct was turned down. Robinson was, was torn down. Robinson, along with other co-conspirators, breached the fence, entered the building. Robinson, assisted by an unidentified co-conspirator, lit an object held by the unidentified co-conspirator who threw it towards the third precinct building with the intent it would start the fire. He lit an object that was held by somebody else, right? So this guy just lit it. Somebody else threw it. All right, I know. I know. On the night of March, uh, May 28, 2000, uh, 2020, Robinson chose to depart from lawful protest and instead engaged in violence and destruction. This is according to acting U.S. Attorney General. He said the arson at the Minneapolis Police Department put lives at risk, contributed to the widespread lawlessness in Minneapolis. With today's sentence, he's held accountable for his actions. ATF is committed to investigating the civil unrest arsons of 2020 that occurred throughout the Twin Cities, said a special agent. Arson is being inherently violent. It's a serious crime. The dangers posed by the defendant was very real. Today's sentencing sends a clear message that regardless of motivation, when someone is intent on conducting a violent act that breaks federal law, the FBI and our law enforcement partners will move assertively to hold them accountable. This type of behavior puts public servants and our entire community in danger, and we will simply not let it go unaddressed. All right, December 15, 2020, Robinson pled guilty to one count of conspiracy to commit arson. And so, you know, this is a picture of it right here. So it looks like Robinson on the left, he's wearing a white shirt somewhere over here, might be, might be over here with a distinctive black stripe across the middle. Wait, wait, wait. Robinson on the left is wearing a white shirt with a distinctive black stripe across the middle and a black stocking cap. This image was taken May 28th from the Minneapolis Police Department surveillance video. The image was submitted with the initial criminal complaint against Robinson. So it's kind of making it sound like it's this guy right here, but that person is on the right, not on the left. So uh, anyways, this is what you're looking at. This is probably the, Mol the Molotov cocktail that, you know, they're all sort of, you know, lighting around and getting ready to throw it. And so, you know, this is 
you know, kind, kind of a hefty sentence. Now, I've seen a lot of people on Twitter saying this is a very light sentence, and a lot of people sort of go, that's it, four years, right, for torching a whole police department? You should add a zero to the end of that. I think Tim Poole said that, that it should be 40 years. And I'm thinking, all right, look, I, I understand it's a serious offense. I understand that arson, burning down a police department is a big deal. But when you have a situation like this, I think that it that it is sort of hard to attribute it to one person. When you have a lot of people who are involved in this mob, you know, act, activity, then it kind of makes sense, in, in my opinion, at least to to uh, divest or divert or dilute the share of the blame across a number of different defendants. And in this case, it sounds like you know there was another person who actually threw it. But they didn't find that guy. He's unidentified. Nobody knows who he is. So isn't he more culpable than the other guy who just lit it? Right? And the kid's 23. I don't know what amount of mitigation that they presented to the court. I know this is probably a horribly unpopular opinion. But, you know, I think that a, a lot of 23-year-old people uh, make mistakes. Okay? When I was 18 to, you know, high school and even in, in college, right, I was borderline, you know, I could have done something like this. Uh, I, 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 maybe not quite like this, but, you know, I, I could have done stuff that would, would have been sort, certainly out of the ordinary. I think we all would have, right? When we were teenagers or, or in our 20s, there's sort of this, this period of young person angst that we have. And if there's a big movement, if there's a big, you know, a bunch of people are all testosterone up going out there and fighting, you know, the power or whatever, I have some empathy for that because I think that it captures a lot of people who are otherwise very good people who just, you know, who, who made, made, made a mistake, got caught up with a bad group of people. And I certainly don't want to see their lives destroyed indefinitely. Four-year prison sentence, pretty reasonable. I mean, that's not that much time. He'll probably get out, you know, uh, sooner than that. The other thing that is a big sentence is a $12 million fine, right? He's never going to pay that back either, uh, especially when he uh, uh, spends basically college in a federal prison. Mozzie, the defense attorney, says he expected the other defendants whom he is not representing to be sentenced to pay a portion of that restitution. There's no realistic chance that he is going to pay anything but a minuscule amount towards that. None of the defendants have an ability to pay a significant sum. Well, yeah, I mean, the, you know, the response from from the other side is going to say, well, they should have burnt down the police department. OK, don't don't torch police buildings. Federal officials said in a criminal complaint last year that in the surveillance video at the precinct house, Robinson, quote, appears to light an incendiary device held by another person who later throws it at the building. Robinson was also captured on video setting fire inside the police station near a first floor stairwell. All right. So that's where it gets worse. Right. So that's where I think more of that higher sentence is justified. Other evidence cited in the complaint came from a Snapchat account federal officials said was used by Robinson. In one video from that account that night, an unidentified female voice can be heard saying, Dylan, the complaint later said. Later, that Snapchat account typed in a message, said, we need gasoline. All right, so they're, they're actively torturing it, so maybe I'm eating my words on this one. Mr. Mousey said officials later identified nearly four dozen separate places of origin for the fire that engulfed the station. That's a lot of different people setting fires at the various spots. Mr. Robinson was unfortunately one of the few who was captured on video and identified. So he is a little bit more culpable than I originally thought from that Twin Cities story. Brainerd man gets four years in prison. This is, again, from the Associated Press. A uh, 12 million bill for helping to firebomb sentence Wednesday, four years. So he's going to have to pay back the 12 million federal complaints. Uh, three other people have pled guilty in federal court, but they're awaiting sentencing. So this is interesting. Yeah. So it sounds like there were four co-defendants uh, other. And, and I can't tell if those four co-defendants or the three co-defendants to Mr. Robinson here, whether or not they. If, if any, hey, it, it wouldn't have been if, if any one of the my question was, was any one of those people any co-defendant, were they the unidentified person who was actually throwing the Molotov cocktail? But again, it doesn't really matter. I mean, if Robinson went inside the building and then started <laughs> lighting things on fire and they've got video of that, yeah, I mean, four years sounds uh, a lot more reasonable. Now, the, the other question would be, is the total restitution significantly more than $12 million? If it's If it's $48 million, then you've got the total restitution divided by four co-defendants equally, or is it 12 million? He's just getting stuck with it. If he can't pay it, then it's going to be sort of joint and severally liable amongst the other co-defendants. So it's, is it 12 divided by four or is it 48 divided by four? We don't know. We have Jeremy Matrita in the house. Let's take a quick look at some of these comments. These should be good. We got Jeremy Matrita says, I hope you have a great week. I hope you did too there, Jeremy. What happens when a defendant receives a judgment they could never possibly pay back, such as with Robinson and 12 million? So it's a good question. 
Uh, a couple things can happen. So, you know, number one is they could uh, garnish his wages basically indefinitely, right? Every time uh, he, you know, files taxes or receives a paycheck, they could just garnish that, right? So he basically is, is paying that back indefinitely. Uh, the other thing, so a, an enforcement mechanism that I have seen for these types of results is the court will sort of put a suspension on some of your civil privileges. So the one I'm talking about is uh, uh, driving. So I've seen this before. I don't do much civil law, as, as you know, but I've seen it in the past where somebody who owes somebody else money, if they don't pay that and a court has entered a judgment against them, the court, at least here in Arizona, will actually suspend that ob the, the party that is obligated to make the payment will suspend their license. So, I mean, they can't, you know, they can't drive anywhere until they get that back in order, which can be a major penalty. penalty. But the, the downside of that, of course, is, well, what if you need to drive to go get a job so you can make some money to pay the money back? but you can't get a license to drive to go to that job. It's a, it's a problem. Uh, so hey, the, the question is, is the government ever going to get $12 million back? Probably not. Uh, good to see you, Jeremy. Hope your week was well, my friend. I'm glad that you're here. We have Chris John says, did people die in the, the burning? No, they didn't. It had all been evacuated at that point in time. So, uh, so that's a good thing. Otherwise he'd be facing murder charges, not just conspiracy for arson. We have go Navy 505. What's up? Go Navy said only discovered your channel recently signed up right away. Yours is the only podcast that holds my interest for the duration. Well, I have a lot to live up to then go Navy. That's, that's good. I'm so glad that you're here. I'm going to do my best. I'll be honest. Sometimes I don't even hold my own interest, so <laughs> I'll try not to do that. You can see me, uh, kind of get mad at stuff and kind of want to spiral off course. I go out, I go down these tangents and I go, Oh yeah, I got to go back and talk about that other thing that that's on my slides. Cause I'm just so uh, discombobulated at times, but and see, see what's happening right now. I'm doing it right now. Uh, all right. So good, great questions. Good to have you here. Navy 505. Really appreciate it. All of those questions came over from watching the watchers dot locals dot com. All right. We're going to change gears a little bit, but still closely related. Want to talk about, uh, Washington DC attorney general, Carl racing, Carl a racing is now announcing that as a result of what happened during the summer protest of 2020, many people were arrested and he is offering to have those people who are arrested to have their records sealed. And he's just sort of volunteering it out there. He's saying, Hey, a year has gone by now. You were arrested. My office, we know that that probably shouldn't have happened. So we're going to go ahead and actively affirmatively offer to seal those records for you. Really, really nice offer. All right, now, so I wanna break down what's going on here. I think this is great. I love it that we have defendants, people who were arrested, people who were sort of gobbled up by law enforcement. The, the opportunity to clear that stuff up, that's a great thing. My question is, is that going to be afforded to other people maybe who have been also in Washington DC during protests, during unrest. We'll see. So the background on the story comes over from the Washington post.com says the DC attorney general offers to seal records of some arrested during the Floyd protests office of Carl Racine said Thursday that it will offer to seal the arrest records of more than 200 people detained for violating curfew orders during protests in early June after police slaying of George Floyd. After Floyd was killed by Chauvin last May and D.C. Mayor Bowser announced a curfew amid the unrest, protests in D.C. resulted in mass arrests. In a statement Thursday, Racine's office said it was sending letters to about 220 individuals arrested for violating the curfew order from beginning of June 2020. So th this, is, this is really about uh, not people being prosecuted, but just being arrested. So people, you know, they there's sort of a multi-prong approach to this or a multi-tier approach. The, the, the police will come, they'll, they'll conduct an arrest, uh, you know, a lawful detention, which will lead into arrest, which will then be sort of be delivered over to the prosecutor's office. At that point in time, the prosecution has the discretion about whether to prosecute that case or not. So, you know, they can, they can take a look at it and just decline to do that. So that's what happened in Washington, DC, about 220 arrests, which is you know, more or less right around the, about the same number of cases that I think we have seen, at least the last number that we checked, uh, that were the Capitol Hill riots, if you recall, the last time that the Washington, DC uh, US Attorney's Office there, the people who were prosecuting th these Capitol Hill cases, the last time 
that they asked for continuances, the numbers that we were looking at were about 300 cases. They just said, well, we're too busy, right? And so, well, they've got uh, at least 220 cases or so, or at least case files that they were looking at that, uh, in this case, that they, they, they have capacity to address. And so the big, the big criticism here, the big sort of disconnect here, of course, is going to be that D.C. Attorney General Carl Racine is not somebody who works for the U.S. Attorney's Office. It's a different jurisdiction. It's, it's Washington, D.C. versus the U.S. Federal Department of Justice. It's sort of a, a local and a federal issue. He's with a different office. The people who are handling the Capitol Hill protests, they're all part of the DOJ U.S. Attorney's Office. So you, you can make that criticism, but my point here is more I'd say fundamental. It's more, you know, on the principle of the matter. If in one situation you have people who are arrested for protesting, for voicing their political opinion, they're out there, you know, participating in American democracy, if you want to call it that or categorize it that way, and they are being proactively offered the opportunity to clear their record up by our own government. So that's great. That's amazing, right? I'm a defense lawyer. I love people getting their records clear, especially when they shouldn't have been charged or arrested in the first place. Fully support it. But my question is, is that from a fundamental principle level, those are people who are getting a benefit from our government. Are the Capitol Hill people going to be looked at through the same lens? Are they going to get that same benefit? Let's say a year from now, a, a bunch of them were arrested for maybe... No reason, just like some of these people were. Are they going to get the same benefit of the doubt? We'll see. So we're just going to mark this one down right now. The people already know that they were not being prosecuted, the statement said, but the letters will inform them that they are eligible to have the record of their arrest sealed and that the attorney general will file a motion to seal on their behalf if they respond. Without the attorney general's assistance, the individuals will have to file motions on their own after a two-year waiting period. So they get to bypass that. Very, very nice. Abby McDonough, a spokesman for the Attorney General, said in the statement that the office wants to, quote, help make the process easier for those individuals and reduce hurdles to have their arrest record sealed. We declined to prosecute the vast majority of protesters who were arrested in early June 2020 for violating the curfew while peacefully protesting in the district. The attorney general formally charged just five people arrested for curfew violations in June. A statement said 80 people arrested for curfew violations who may have previous arrest records are precluded by law from having their records sealed. According to the statement, because they've got priors, a, a sample letter released by the attorney general's office, which we have, we're going to go through that here, said the decision not to prosecute was not based on a determination of whether those charged had committed an offense. Says rather, we are exercising our discretion not to prosecute you based on an evaluation of the specific facts of your case and your criminal history or lack thereof. Please note that you that should you be re rearrested for this offense, AOG, OAG may decide to prosecute you for that offense and or oppose the sealing of your arrest. All right. So, you know, this is something that is actually kind of common. So uh, kind not, not quite this far. So let me give you an example of something that, that was happening here in Arizona until we just recently legalized mar marijuana, recreational marijuana. So before that, it was a class six felony for uh, class six at the lowest. It could even be a class four based on what you had. But Long story short, it was a felony to possess marijuana in Arizona. And so we had a program here called TASC. It was sort of a deferred prosecution program where if it was your first offense, you never got in trouble before, you would get a letter, kind of like the one that I'm about to show you, that would say, hey, listen, we know you were charged with a crime, uh, but since it's your first offense, we're going to give you this deal. We're going to give you a deal. If you go and take classes, if you go to drug screening, alcohol screening, whatever, and you sort of stay clean for six months or one year, you, you do randomized testing from time to time. You go in and you give them a sample and you, you, you just you're, you're clean. After 12 months go by, what happens? They dismiss those charges against you. That's pretty common. It's called a diversion agreement. In exchange for you doing something, the government's going to give you a benefit. And this is good. I, th I think these are great things because we want more of that in our justice system. We want more rehabilitation. We want to help people restore themselves beyond their prior situation that led to their criminality. We want to help people improve their lives. The way to do that is through education and classes, not with criminal convictions and prison time. So diversion deals, I think, are a, a, a very good thing. But this is one step further than that. This is this was not that, right? These people were not prosecuted. These people were arrested 
And based on the fact that they're not prosecuting them, this is the prosecution now going out and affirmatively saying, we're, we're going to clean up that arrest. In other words, we shouldn't have even arrested you, really. We're going to go help you seal all of this stuff. Taking an active role. Not just saying, well, you know, you did something wrong and we just declined to arrest you. So we're just going to leave that. We're actually going to go fix some of that for you. It's a very proactive thing that's happening here. And it's not something that I even disagree with. Okay, and we've had an issue with this throughout this country. We've seen this in Arizona. Uh, a lot of peaceful protesters, I think protesting isn't necessarily that productive. And, and I don't know really what people expect to get out of it. That's a whole separate topic, though. But if they're peacefully protesting, it's their American right to do so, damn it. So go out there and do it as long as they're not protesting or, uh, I'm sorry, you know, uh, uh, rioting, torching buildings, injuring people, throwing things or threatening society. I've got no problem at all with that. Following the rules, it's great. And if the cops and our law enforcement entities are penalizing that, that's a no-no. That's, that, that's, that's an over-encroachment of government. And that's bad no matter who's protesting. I don't care whether that's the MAGA or... Uh, you know, the, the lefties on the other side, it, it, it you know, the line has to be drawn. And if they are going to be you know, arresting people in a show of force and causing their records to be blemished, then I think they should go, go back and help clean those things up. But my question is, is this going to be equal? Are we going to see something like this across the board for all defendants? Or is this just a special category, an exclusion of the George Floyd protesters, right? Did they get a special bucket of privilege that other people do not get? I'm going to guess that they will. Very unlikely that we're going to see anything like this for anybody who is involved or even in the zip code during January 6th, which is a problem because we have two tiers of justice if that continues to develop. I know that many people are sort of doing cartwheels out there. Hey, the Trump supporters, they're still in custody. Meanwhile, everybody over here is getting diversion agreements. We, it's the same justice system. It's not supposed to be multiple outcomes for different people doing essentially the same thing, right? Vastly different penalties. That's not fair. It's not equal. And that's why it's problematic. So we have some more information on this over from uh, WUSA9. So this gentleman, I actually broke the story and I wanna show you uh, his summation of what's going on here. Leslie, now the DC Attorney General sending out this letter to those 220 protesters. It says, if DC Metropolitan Police arrested you for June protests for breaking curfew during those protests last year, here is how he is going to help. Now, last year we showed you how MPD pushed protesters, most of them peaceful, from main streets to a residential side street for mass arrests. Around 200 people were arrested the night of June 1st on Swan Street Northwest. 70 protesters took shelter overnight inside Swan Street resident Rahul Dubey's home. This March, we first told you that DC's Attorney General decided not to prosecute those MPD that they did arrest that night. Now today, the his office announced it would provide free and immediate help to file court motions to get D.C. judges to expunge those protesters' <laughs> arrest records. Now, this can save those peaceful protesters not only money on attorney's fees, but also time, because typically speaking, it takes two years, at least two years, from us to have any chance to get it off of a person's record. Now, we have more details on what this means and also how you can contact the D.C. Attorney General's office if you do not get this letter automatically sent to you. We have that on WUSA9.com. Reporting live, Nathan Bach at WUSA9. That's a All right, Nathan Bach uh, giving us a summation there. And he's exactly right, by the way. You know, this is, you know, attorneys charge good money for this type of legal work to expunge records and seal records. I mean, that's, you know, this is a gift that, that these people are being given. Otherwise, you know, I, I, maybe some of them have even already hired counsel to go out and solve this problem for them. You know, now they don't have to do it because they have an unopposed, uh, motion. They have agreement from the government that, yeah, if you want to seal it, no problem. Just go in here, file some paperwork. We'll even do it for you. So you know, it really sort of helping them get this done quickly and inexpensively because the government is paying for a large part of it. This is the letter that's going out. You can see it here. It says the government of the District of Columbia, Office of the Attorney General, the consent motion to seal the arrest record and so they're blanking some of this information out. Of course, this is the, the, the address of the person who is receiving this. The Office of the Attorney General for D.C. received notice that you were arrested back on June 1 for violation of the curfew order. The 
attorney general has decided not to file charges against you. After reviewing your record, we determined that you're eligible to have your arrest sealed. We are writing to ask whether you would like our office to file a motion on your behalf asking the judge to seal the record of this arrest. In D.C., certain arrest records are el eligible for sealing provided that you, the movement, the person seeking to have it sealed, meets the statutory requirements. Of course, we did that over at the Attorney General's office. You look good to go. To have it sealed, law requires you to file a motion and ask the judge to seal the record, but we can file that for you. We just need your permission. Attached as a letter is a copy of the motion we would file on your behalf. Okay, so think about this. They're actually already drafting this stuff. Uh, or, or they have a template that, that they're attaching here. It says, if you consent, OAG will file the attached motion. It will then be up to the judge to decide whether to grant the motion to seal. If you would like OAG to file the attached motion to seal, please respond, send us an email, subject line with your name, date, all this stuff. Decision to prosecute you was not based on any determination of whether you committed this offense. Rather, we are exercising our discretion not to prosecute you based upon an evaluation of the specific facts of your case and your criminal history or lack thereof. So you can see this says here, uh, if we don't hear from you, we're not gonna file it, let us know. Signed off on here by Carl A. Racine and Pete Seda over the chief at the criminal section. And then as the letter mentioned, right, they're actually showing you what they're gonna file. And it uh, looks something like this. This is a copy of the consent motion to seal arrest records. Not gonna go through this whole thing, but I just wanted to show you, right? So they have the person here. It looks like their name is uh, blacked out. They have the arrest number. It's a closed case because this person uh, is, is not being charged of anything. So uh, you know, they just have the arrest number, right? It's not even an actual case because it hasn't been filed in court yet. So they go through the different statutes, DC code, and a person does this, and here's an, a, a violation of this. and. Uh, judge shall weigh these different things in considering whether to seal it. It's in the interest of justice to grant this motion, this, this says, because the interest in sealing an arrest record outweighs the community interest in viewing these records. Curfew imposed was a temporary order spanning a few days. Violating a temporary curfew order is a minor infraction, and public access to this arrest record would no longer serve legitimate public interest. Arguably, employers would not rely upon a curfew violation arrest for making hiring decisions or retaining employees. Additionally, in this case, the district concedes that the public safety was not endangered. Lastly, given its temporality, there is virtually no rehabilitation that can occur for violating a curfew order that is no longer in effect. So the government totally agrees. Once again, signed off on by Peter Saba. And I agree with this, right? If, if, if I don't want more people being arrested unnecessarily in this country, we have way too much of that already. I would make just like to make sure that this is being equally applied to other defendants in similar situations, regardless of the jurisdiction. If this is out of D.C., this is the, the local D.C. jurisdiction. Great. Well, sounds like you guys have a lot of capacity here to go and help maybe the U.S. attorney's office. You are also lawyers and you're also in Washington, D.C., I'm gonna guess that you're also licensed to practice law in federal court. You have apparently enough time to work on 220 cases to help people clear their records up, which is great. I applaud that. Maybe you could also go upstairs with the U.S. Attorney's Office and help them because they keep asking for continuances because they're overwhelmed. They can't process something like 300 cases. You got you know 220 different case files you can work on. Maybe you can de delegate some of that time so that those people are not being stuck with due process violations as you are continuing to keep them in custody as you ask for continuances because you can't run your office appropriately. And I was thinking more about this the other day. You know, this type of surge is something that happens, right? Uh, think about this from a, 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 just your local city. Okay, in Arizona, every year we have the waste management open. Last year it was very small because of the, the thing that's going on in the world, but it was, you know, it's something that happens every year. And a lot of people come, something like 100,000 people come through. And every year there is a surge in certain types of cases like urinating in public and uh, you know criminal littering and consumption in, in, uh, in public and all sorts of different you know event type of crimes. And every year, all of the prosecuting agencies around our state, they're able to handle the influx of new cases. Do you think that there's more than 300 cases that come out of a four day event where over 100,000 people walk through it? Yeah, of course. Same with the Super Bowls. Same with any big events. So I still, you know, the more and more I think about this Capitol Hill continuance stuff, the more and more it just rubs me the wrong way because I think it is a poor excuse for whittling away and watering down very important 
civil rights. John Delar, 52, is in the house from watching the watchers.locals.com says, do you believe we are headed for another civil war? I know that many people are starting to believe that. I don't think so, uh, John Delar. You know, I, I, per, uh, I, I, I tend to be you know, kind of an optimist, I think, in most things. I think that, yes, we have a lot of vitriol towards one another, but I think that, that generally life is pretty good, right? I mean, if you can unplug from politics, you know, we just went through something awful in 2020, and, and people are, I think, I think people are, you know, are, are keeping it together for the most part. And even though everybody's agitated about the direction of the country and everybody's at each other's throats over race and taxes and health care and abortion and gay rights and all this stuff, I think most people are pretty, pretty content. You know, at, at the end of the day, do you want to sit on your couch and watch your Netflix and order your DoorDash? Or do you want to go pick up your firearms and your pitchforks and go out there in the middle of the street and duke it out with your neighbor? I mean, wh wh which one of those, really? And if you look around our society, which one of those things is actually going to happen? Okay, it's going to be the Netflix and chill. It's not going to be the alternative. Now, you know, there may be some soft decoupling that happens, which is, I think, a better, uh, uh, you know, way to think about it, right? There, there, there may be some, some states or some uh, segments of our country in different countries that just decide eh, maybe this doesn't work out for us anymore. Maybe we just need to separate a little bit. Uh, but that, uh, if something like that happened, I imagined that it would be peaceful because I just don't think that there's anything uh, that justifies a war, right? I mean, when you say civil war, I, I'm thinking of guns and, you know, physical battle. And I just don't see that. Jack Elias says, we don't need a lack of accountability for these terrorists or any other criminals. What we need is a return to principle that once one has done their time, they are reinstated in full as a fellow citizen. Yeah, I, yeah, I agree with that. And so, Jack Elias, I think I, I, I agree with you, right? Once, once the debt has been paid, you should wipe the slate clean. That's why you pay the debt. I don't like this concept of sort of uh, prolongated, indefinite servitude to the criminal justice system. Oh, you committed a felony 10 years ago? Guess what? You still can't vote. Guess what? You still can't purchase a firearm. Oh, but you did your time and you've been on probation. You've been paying your fines, not doing anything, and not, never broken the law again. There should be a restoration of your ability to be a full citizen. And uh, unfortunately, our current system doesn't work that way. Now, in this case, the difference here is that they were not actually charged with a crime. So to return them to whole would be to erase their arrest records, which is, again, why I support it. I don't think that, you know, this happens a lot. Somebody's just arrested and they're not charged with a crime. Or let's say, for example, somebody is arrested and uh, the prosecution doesn't believe them. You go to a trial and you get them acquitted, right? They, they're, they're not convicted. Their record is still public. You can still go find that stuff. So that person still has that blemish on their record, even though they were acquitted. And it can be kind of difficult to you know, wipe that clean because it's all out on the internet already. Once it hits the interwebs, it's history. No cleaning that up. We got Liberty or Death says, and for those who are not, quote, eligible for the AG to do this, they can rely on a pardon from President Kamala Harris. After all, she bailed out the rioters. She sure did. I think that tweet is still up, isn't it? We have, speaking of protest, uh, from Nadar Blasir says, did you hear about the pissed off parents in your neck of the woods? That AZ heat must have come early this year. Yeah, and so uh, he is pointing to this story. So watch now, hundreds protest mask policy for a Vail school shut down a board meeting. So in Vail, Arizona, we've got parents rally for the school district to drop the mask mandate in schools. And I think I, think I did read this story or I saw a, a snippet of it. If I recall correctly, I think that these people in Vail, Arizona, went into the, uh, the school board and they said, hey, we want this mask uh, stuff off. And the school board said, I think this is this story. The school board said, no, it's not going to happen. So we're just going to go ahead and adjourn the meeting. You all peasants out there, we are the people in charge. We're the people with power and we're not going to comply. Okay, we know what we're doing, little people. Thanks for playing. Go away. So the board members on the school board left. And then what happened was... Uh, the people, the school, the, the, the parents actually knew Robert's rules of order for conducting these types of committees, and they just did it. They said, okay, well, okay, t today is the date and time for the meeting. Uh, there's nobody here to run it, so let's go to the rules. The rules say that uh, we, need four, we need seven people who are representative of the, the school district. Okay, we got you, Karen, and uh, Jan, and uh, Billy, and everybody. Okay, 
great, got you guys. So we're going to form a quorum now. You just got elected. You just got elected. You just got elected. And you just got elected. What do you people think about the mask mandate? We hate it. It's all going away. Okay. Do I have a motion? Yep. Do I have a second? Got that one. All, up, all in favor? All opposed? And that's it. Right? <laughs> so they just took it over. I think it's that story. And uh, hey, man, that's Arizona. That's how we do it, baby. I love it. We got Patriot Must says, Rob, I'm greatly disappointed in the response. History has shown that republics like all nations face more civil wars than any other country. It is going to happen from Patriot Musk. Well, I, yeah, I mean, you know, look, Patriot Musk, the, 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 the concern I have is the war parts. Okay. If there's a, a decoupling of, you know, different parts of the world and realignments that I'm not necessarily opposed to, but if it's a war with tanks and, you know, Arizona versus New Mexico, man, I don't want, I don't, I don't, I don't want that. I hope that it doesn't happen. Maybe it's inevitable, but I hope that it, I hope that it isn't because we're civilized people, aren't we? We can have conversations about these things. You know, you know what I think we should probably do is to solve all of our problems. We should elect really competent people who are very smart. We should send them to like one location where they can think about these problems and solve it for us. That'd be a great idea. <laughs> Uh, we're in trouble. All right. So next story, we are going to change gears. Thanks for those questions over from watching the watchers.locals.com. Thank you, everybody. Okay. And so we're going to change gears. Galen Maxwell, so much activity going on in this case. It's kind of hard to keep up. The courts are receiving multiple letters every day and a new exhibit just came out. Exhibit B that was filed by Galen Maxwell's attorneys showing this image of her having a bruise on the inside of what looks like her left eyeball. So you can see that right here. This is this is from a court document. And we're gonna go through this letter from Ms. Sternheim, uh, Galen Maxwell's lawyer. And you can see this right here, right? Not a real good looking, uh, looks like a bruise. You know, looks like a, a, a vessel popped or something is going on there. And you know, so people are speculating about what that is. Is this um, some sort of a laceration? Was she hit here? Did she, you know, uh, is she too stressed out? Is she popping blood vessels in her eyes? Is she not getting appropriate nutrition? A lot of potential things going on here. Uh, but the point is, is her defense attorney is now raising the red flag saying, hey, this is a problem. I've been telling you for months now that the conditions in this federal prison are very, very problematic. We've already heard about it, saying that the guards wake her up every 15 minutes. Miss Maxwell made a claim that they were violating her during one of the pat downs. We know that, you know, guards, uh, Oh, there, there was you know, sewage and stuff being backed up apparently in her toilet. She's waking up every 15 minutes. I may have already said a lot, right? The, the attorneys have a litany, a huge list of things that they are just not happy about. So now the attorneys are looking at this going, see, we told you so. She just got popped in the eye or, you know, her, her blood levels or something's problematic here. Judge, we're asking for your help. The judge is curious. Let's just say that. All right. So this, the first story comes over from the AP says a judge seeks answers for jails Galen Maxwell treatment. Judge ordered the government on Thursday yesterday to explain why guards repeatedly flash light into Maxwell's cell overnight. An action her lawyers say may have led to a bruise over one of her eyes as she awaits a trial in an alleged sex trafficking conspiracy with Jeffrey Epstein. Judge Allison Nathan issued an order after her lawyer for Maxwell complained that guards threatened to punish her client after Maxwell was unable to explain the bruise above one eye and was noticed Wednesday night when she saw her reflection in a nail clipper. Lawyer Bobby Sternheim said the 59-year-old Maxwell may have gotten the bruise as she tries to shield her eyes from the light that awakens her every 15 minutes as the guards make sure she's breathing. Ms. Maxwell is unaware of the cause of the bruise, as reported to medical and psych staff. She has grown increasingly reluctant to report information to the guards for fear of retaliation, discipline, and punitive chores, Sternheim wrote. Maxwell has pled not guilty to sex trafficking charges, alleged, alleging she recruited teen boys. Epstein didn't kill himself back in 2019. A lawyer for Maxwell told a three-judge panel 
for a second circuit court that uh, court of appeals that Maxwell is being treated as if she is a suicide risk, even though she is not one. And so, as we know, when you are on you know, suicide watch, they are making sure that you're not going to commit suicide or die by suicide. And they are checking you very frequently. You have a lot less of the same amenities that you would have. Uh, Epstein was on that, I think, once or twice. I think he may have just gotten off of that when uh, when he uh, got deceased, let's say. And so you know, she's been in those higher level, stricter protocols for a long period of time. And her attorneys are now saying, well, look what you're doing. Look what you're doing to her. See, and as I've said many times, just what, what's so impressive about this from a defense perspective is these are just every single minor issue, every little hiccup, every sliver of any minutia, they are calling it front and center. They are making such a massive deal about it and they're doing a great job. I mean, they're doing a, ma a magnificent job. Uh, this, this representation is so thorough. When I, every time I go on and look at a case like this, I can't, there, there are so many different documents flying back and forth every which way. And, and what's so amazing about this, this is not the crime of the century. Okay. This is a sex trafficking case. This is like a few people traveling around on some airplanes and sleeping with a, an underage person. Okay, like it's not it, it's it's awful and not good and I'm not you know, excusing that, but it's not complicated. It's a relatively simple crime relative to other types of criminal charges that involve all sorts of complicated things. I mean, even the DUI case is complicated relative to this, unless this involves a lot of other things that we don't know about. Right? A DUI case involves gas chromatography, and you got to do all deep dive analysis on you know, mass spectrometry and all these different things that require a lot of depth and scientific knowledge. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a difficult criminal case from an intellectual perspective, because there's a lot of deep dives that you can do. We saw some of this with Chauvin. A lot of the same toxicologists and the, the analysis that you, that you saw in that trial are the same expert witnesses that you would hear in a DUI case. Maxwell's case has none of that, right? It's just a few people traveling around and we've got some witnesses, some victims who say, yeah, they slept with me. They groomed me to do these things. So what's so complicated about this case? Why are there 2.7 million pages of documents in this case for a simple sex trafficking case involving four minor victims. Well, it's because her lawyers are blowing up the hell out of everything. I mean, every single thing that goes on. We've already talked about this earlier in the week. Bobby Sternheim was in the in there or one of somebody from her office was with Galen Maxwell earlier in the week having a conversation about the case. And the guards say allegedly that when Miss Maxwell went into the facility to have this meeting with her lawyers, she wasn't carrying documents. Then when she left, she was carrying documents, so they confiscated those things from her. Well, that's a big problem. If you are a defense lawyer and you're trying to work with your client, you give your client confidential case material, and the people who are prosecuting you, which is the government in this case, they take those documents into their possession. That's your private confidential information. They don't have any access to that. That's attorney-client privilege. Huge problem. So that happens. Then they basically are blaming Maxwell and Sternheim, saying, you violated protocols. Bobby Sternheim responds, says, the hell we are. Now you're accusing me of something. So I want all of your records about every single thing that you ever said, including what you had for breakfast that morning and whether you put butter on your toast or not, because it is now relevant. It's now accessible because you're accusing me of something. I get access to that stuff. You just open the door on all this. And this is happening every which way you turn, every little thing that pops up. You know, and I said I've been I've been following this for a long period of time. Right. We were talking about how often Maxwell gets access to her lawyers. And I said months ago, I said, if I was that attorney on the other end of that, I would have, you know, an intern or somebody dedicated full time calling Galen Maxwell every 15 minutes or every hour just to make sure that you have access. Right. Access to your client. Just to say, I, I, just, I just needed to ask her a quick question. Uh, what happened on this day? I just have a question about this sentence. And then every time that you didn't speak with her, every time that you didn't have access, you just make a log. Government denied access, denied access, denied access, denied access, denied access. Then what do you have, right? You have a failure to provide counsel. You have a right to counsel violation. And you're just seeing this. You're seeing the framework of this thing laid out every day, just one after the other. And it's... It's impressive. It's really, really something to see. You know, I, I, I'm trying to communicate it well. I'm not sure that I'm doing a good job of it, but you know, from a from a defense perspective, this is so, so, so intense. Just in terms of the sheer volume of documents, it's it's a sight to behold. All right, so enough of that. Let's go back to the article. It says a lawyer for the three judge panel already talked about that. Two judges 
said that they expressed concern about the light that is flashed in Maxwell's cell at night, interrupting her sleep. Government lawyer conceded to the appeals panel that Maxwell was not has not been declared a suicide risk as she argued for Maxwell to remain behind bars prior to a trial scheduled for July 12th. Defense lawyers, and we'll see if that happens, July 12th, uh, like two months from now, we're almost at May, oh my goodness. Defense lawyers have asked that the trial be delayed until next January, which is probably more likely. Remember, the government just disclosed like 2.7 million documents. Ma Fox did an, an analysis on that. It was like 983 feet. It'd be like one of the tallest skyscrapers in Arizona, right? If you if you, if you built that that amount of uh, uh, of discovery, it's, it's crazy. It's a, it's a lot of material for something that is not a complicated case. All right. Second circuit, or it is, apparently it is a complicated case, but the real question there then is why? What's so complicated about it? Who will, who's involved? That's why everybody's so curious. What's going on here? All right. Second circuit in a brief order upheld the court's decision to thrice deny Maxwell bail on the grounds that she is a flight risk. Defense lawyers offered to put up $28.5 million and hire 24-hour armed guards to prove that Maxwell would not flee. Maxwell, U.S. citizen, off also offered to renounce her British and France citizens citizenships. But the judge still said, sorry. Appeals court directed Nathan to deal with any complaints about her sleep conditions. So we're going to take a look at the letter here in a minute. In her order on Thursday, Nathan directed the government to find out if Maxwell is being subjected to flashlight surveillance every 15 minutes at night or any other atypical flashlight surveillance? If so, the judge said government needs to explain the basis for doing so. So, and, and whether Maxwell can be provided with the appropriate eye covering. I'm going to show you that order here in a second. Maxwell's lawyer told the Second Circuit she had to cover her eyes with a towel or socks because they didn't give her a mask. Ian Maxwell, Maxwell's brother, said in a statement that he was shocked my sister's guards didn't immediately refer her for proper medical care. Instead, he said they bullied and harassed her, effectively blaming the victim. Simple solution is to review the round-the-clock security camera footage and see what may have occurred, he added, which, which sounds right. It sounds pretty simple. I mean, if she's got cameras all over her, somebody should be able to scrub through that and see what's going on. He added, apart from whatever happened in this house of horrors, I can report Galen's family and friends continue to support her. We are confident once this is over, it will be the prosecutor who has a proverbial black eye. Whoa, buddy boy. Whoa. Careful. Careful there. All right. So here's the letter. This came over from Bobby Sternheim's law office. You can see this was filed yesterday, April 29th, page one of four. We're not going to go through. Actually, it's short. We're going to go through the two pages because the other two are uh, uh, exhibits, very short exhibits. So here's what we've got. Dear Judge Nathan, this is coming from Maxwell's lawyer. She's sending this to the judge. She's saying during oral argument, Maxwell's bail appeal before the circuit. So they're, you know, they took this up to the appeals court. Counsel who is uh, not Bobby Sternheim, so a, a, different, a, a different appeals court lawyer, said that she was improperly deprived of sleep while being detained. In the denial of her appeal, the circuit court said, to the extent that the appellant, Maxwell, seeks relief to her sleeping conditions, direct these to the district court. So the court of appeals is now saying, hey, if you've got a problem with the sleep stuff, take it up with the district court, the lower level court, and that's what Bobby's doing. She says, we press our concerns regarding this issue, the disruption of the sleep and the del deleterious effects sleep deprivation is having on her health, well-being, and the ability to prepare for and withstand trial. Now, if she can't sleep, her health is bad, as is evident by what we see in her eyeball. Her well-being's off. We already know that. And she can't prepare for her trial. So you are violating her right to uh, an effective defense by not letting her sleep. You, you see what's happening? They're just laying the framework for an appeal. So if they lose, they can say, well, of course we lost. She couldn't sleep. So how could she possibly be prepared? She couldn't. Miss Maxwell continues to be disrupted throughout the night by guards, shining a flash strobe light into her cell, claiming that her breathing must be checked. The myth that Miss Maxwell's conditions of confinement are related to her being a suicide risk was laid to rest during the oral argument. There was nothing to support that contrived claim. Miss Maxwell is classified with standard CC1MH designation inmate with no significant mental health care. Contrary to the report that she wears an eye mask when she sleeps, which was in the government's document that was in the docket number 196 at item four, 
They say that an item was neither available for purchase at the commissary nor provided to her. She resorts to using a sock or a towel to cover her eyes in an awkward attempt to shield them from disrupting illumination every 15 minutes. Last night, she was confronted by staff due to a visible bruise over her left eye. The black eye is depicted in Exhibit B. I just showed you that, but we're going to look at it again here in a minute. Despite 24-7 camera surveillance, except when guards elect to exert authority in an intimidating way off camera, as they did during Saturday's bathroom incident, no guard addressed the bruise until Miss Maxwell, who has no mirror, caught a reflection of her aching eye in the glean of a nail clipper. At that point, staff confronted Maxwell regarding the source of the bruise, bruise threatening to place her in the SHU if she did not reveal how she got it. Miss Maxwell is unaware of the cause of the bruise. As reported to medical and psych staff, she has grown increasingly reluctant to report information to the guards for fear of retaliation, discipline, and punitive chores. However, there is concern that the bruise may be related for her, may be related to the need for Maxwell to shield her eyes from the lights being projected through the cells at night. MDC routinely places inmates in SHU, which must be solitary if they have engaged in physical altercation with other inmates to protect inmates who are the subject of abuse. It would be ironic if the MDC follows through with its threat to place her in there. It would signal that she needs protection from the very staff so intent on protecting her since she has no contact with anyone but staff. As suggested by the circuit, we asked the court to address this. Stop the 15-minute light surveillance of Ms. Maxwell or justify the need for it. Very truly yours, Bobby Sternheim. So, right, it's, 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 it's a good point. It's a, great, it's a great point. And now that we have this little eye thing and we have the Court of Appeals ruling, they can make a big deal out about it. About it. And here is what the judge had to say. So, judge here says... By May 5th, 2021, the government is ordered to confer with legal counsel for the prison for the jail and provide the court responses to the following questions. Number one, is Ms. Maxwell being subjected to flashlight surveillance every 15 minutes at night or any other atypical flashlight surveillance? And if so, what is the basis for doing so? And if so, can she be provided with the appropriate eye covering? Ordered April 29th, by Allison Nathan, U.S. District Court judge, says the government is further ordered to share its response with defense counsel before filing it on ECF so that defense counsel can indicate whether they believe any private medical information needs to be redacted before public filing so ordered. So then the question is, uh, is there going to be any private medical information in there? If not, on May 5th, then we're going to get a copy of this response or we'll, we'll see whatever their response is. Now, I think you can sort of extrapolate where they're going with this, right? If they are checking her, they probably want to make sure she's breathing. She's not, you know, doing anything nefarious in there. Uh, but again, every 15 minutes, you know, I don't, I'm not sure what you can do in those intervals. You know, she getting up and chiseling away at something in, in, in 14 minutes and sneaking back into bed. No, it's like, it's not enough time, but you know, this is, um, there's a lot of activity here. The Second Circuit Court says here, we, we covered this earlier in the week, I think, filed, uh, but they filed this today. Under consideration, it's ordered. The district court orders are affirmed. Bail is, is again denied. She expressed concern that she was being improperly deprived of sleep. And then this is the order that says that they have permission to go back to the district judge. So we have uh, another letter here. Uh, this is so this is a follow up. Let me frame this out real quick. We got a back and forth that happened yesterday. So we've, we've, we've talked about this previously, I think earlier this week, in fact, there was this idea that there was a meeting between Bobby Sternheim, Ms. Maxwell's lawyer, or somebody, maybe two people from her office, they went into the prison facility, or the, the jail, She's, uh, we'll, we'll call it jail, you know what I mean, if, if I say prison, I mean jail, going into the jail and having a privileged meeting, and then when she left, Maxwell had documents that apparently she shouldn't have had. Bobby Sternheim said, no, she had those documents when they came in with, with her, but the guards didn't check her. So that's sort of the defense here. No, I didn't give her anything. She came in with them. Typically, the guards will check so that they can do sort of an inventory. They can say, what did you come in with? Make sure that you leave. You come in, you leave with what you came in with, not, nothing extra. So what uh, Ms. Sternheim is saying is that she did come in with those documents. When she left and you took them, that was a violation of attorney-client privilege. And they got a letter back. So Ms. Sternheim got a letter from the prison facility, uh, a woman by the name of, well, we're going to get to it in the next slide, responded and said, 
hey, just so you know, we did actually seize these materials from Ms. Maxwell. Just wanted to let you know. Bobby Sternheim responded, said, oh, that's a violation. Everything that you have in your file, I want, just don't even, don't even email it. Just have U-Haul come over there and pick up all of your file cabinets because I want everything in there. And now I'm entitled to it because you're accusing me of violating uh, protocol. So this is sort of the back and forth now that's taking place. This is now Bobby Sternheim sending a letter over to the judge explaining what's going on. And then we're going to see the government responding back. So let's take a quick look here. You'll notice this was filed again yesterday, April 29th. It says, Dear Judge Nathan, this is signed off by Bobby, uh, which is Maxwell's lawyer, says Le uh, the, the jail legal persists in falsely accusing Ms. Maxwell's counsel of violating Brooklyn jail's legal visit procedures. This allegation is reckless, false, and defamatory. At no time did counsel provide documents to Ms. Maxwell for her retention and uh, that did not originate from Ms. Maxwell. The April 29th letter from MDC Legal states that supervisory staff reviewed video surveillance footage, but notably does not state the contents of that video surveillance. Interesting. The fact that MDC Legal does not claim to have reviewed the video or report the contents of the video footage speaks volumes. Further, and contrary to the jail's letter, jail staff did in fact, quote, seize and retain Ms. Maxwell's confidential legal documents after the legal visit on April 24th. While most of those documents were returned to Ms. Maxwell, other documents, which the MDC concedes were, quote, confiscated, were not returned to her, but rather given to her counsel the next day. As previously stated, documents returned to Ms. Maxwell counsel was, quote, legal mail, which had been sent to Ms. Maxwell sometime prior to April 24th. Counsel did not bring those documents into the facility. MDC, the jail, admits and flouts the fact that guards read Ms. Maxwell's confidential materials. This is no small matter. She's absolutely right about that. Miss Maxwell is working tirelessly to review and discuss her attorneys, uh, discuss with her attorneys, literally millions of pages of documents and she, right, literally like 2.7 deterioration of her confidential communications with her attorney does not produce a fair and just trial. We press our request to court direct MDC to provide Maxwell's counsel with a copy of the video recording. So, oh my gosh, that's just right. And the court, what's the court going to do? Yeah. It's her legal documents. What are you guys reading her legal files for? What this does also is it sort of chills the prison and the government because every time they know, now they know they're on record now. Shoot. Are we going to, are we going to complain about that? Maxwell's doing something. Are we going to complain? Are we don't send Bobby a letter? Are you nuts? She's going to make our lives miserable for the next 45 days. You out of your mind, let her get away with whatever she wants. I don't want to open that up again. Because now they're going to be looking at the video. And now they're going to look to see whether the government's characterization of the video is, is accurate or not. And what if it's not? What if you watch the video and it's clear as day? What if you watch it and it's clear as day that there was no transfer of documents? That Bobby Sternheim and Maxwell's defense team did not give her a thing. The government didn't do that, but they seized those records anyways. And they read them. <laughs> oh, it's going to be good. Gonna be good, my friends. All right, so here's a letter back. This is coming over from Allison Nathan, or this is from uh, going to Judge Nathan. You can see this is uh, filed today. So we had this one from Bobby filed on 42921. This one filed back today from the U.S. Department of Justice, the Federal Bureau of Prisons. So this is being signed off on by Sophia Papatru, who is staff attorney over at the prison facility. So she says, all right, listen, this letter is in response to an earlier letter. So to her April 28th letter, which is the one that we do not have. But it says here, it's, it, you know, uh, uh, Bobby Sternheim just fires off letters. I mean, she's just, bah! gone gone next one boom and it's just like a like a machine gun so she's referring to a letter that we we did not cover today but i think we covered it earlier in the week it, it's about this incident that we're talking about so seeking the following information so this is a letter written in response to your april 28th order seeking the following information regarding an alleged incident at the detention center an inventory of the items seized from Ms. Maxwell in the incident that occurred on April 24th is going to be provided to defense counsel only. A representation indicating whether any of the seized materials were duplicated in any way was undertaken in order to determine this information. 
So they're going to give over a representation indicating whether Ms. Maxwell is permitted to bring confidential materials to in-person meetings, what steps have been taken to ensure the confidentiality of the lawyer-client communications. And here's what they say. They say, at no point during or after the April 24th legal visit were any materials seized and retained by Brooklyn staff. Those materials that the defense counsel gave to Ms. Maxwell, contrary to the legal visit procedures, were confiscated by staff and returned to defense counsel on April 25th. So, they're at, so that's what, really what we're talking about. Did defense counsel give it to her or not? They're saying that they did. At no point were any materials seized during or after April 24th. Those materials that the defense counsel gave to Ms. Maxwell against the policies, they were confiscated by staff and returned on April 25th. Yeah, but Bobby says that they didn't give her anything. And folks, this is these are lawyers. These are like high-powered lawyers and staff attorneys for the facility, right? This did, did she give the documents or not? Where the hell did these pieces of paper come from? Can somebody figure that out? In addition, none of Ms. Maxwell's legal materials, including those items given to her during her April 24th legal visit, were photocopied. Supervisory staff discussed the incident with staff involved and reviewed video surveillance footage. Ms. Maxwell may bring any legal materials she wishes to carry from her housing area to her in-person meetings pursuant to our policies. An inmate's legal materials are visually inspected for contraband by a visiting room officer. To ensure inmates do not bring unauthorized materials into the room, Inmates are only allowed to rem remove those legal materials they brought to the legal visit. All legal visits are subject to visual monitoring only. In addition to in-person legal visits, Ms. Maxwell may request unmonitored legal calls through the unit team for five hours a day. Brooklyn will continue to abide by said procedures to ensure attorney-client communications remain confidential. Okay, so let's piece this together. Here on April 29th, which is when Bobby Sternheim wrote this together, she's talking about this. MDC Legal does, does not claim to have reviewed the video or report the contents of the video, and the fact that they don't report the contents speaks volumes. Okay, well, they just said here that they did. Supervisory staff discussed the incident with staff involved and reviewed video surveillance footage. All right, so maybe Bobby's off on that. Maybe they did review it. And if they did, well, then they want a copy of it because Ms. Sternheim is saying we want all of those being sent over to us. We request the court direct them to provide Ms. Maxwell with a copy of the video recording. So um, hopefully the court grants that to them, says, yep, you got it. Send that video over to the defense counsel. I'd like to see it, right? And I'm sure Bobby would too. And what if it doesn't show her giving her any documents and the government just sees them anyways? Oh my goodness. All right. So let's take a quick look at some questions over from watchingthewatchers.locals.com. And our first one in the house comes from Leafy Bug. It says, so the defense is trying to get the case dismissed on procedural violations, correct? What's the probability of success given the high profile nature of the case. So uh, I would say, uh, so, so sort of, right? They're, it's a great question and you're on the right track. So, so I do not think that they're trying to get the case dismissed on procedural violations, right? So, it, but it's very close to that. They're trying to lay out a framework that would give them opportunities to appeal and sort of just what, you know, whittle away at the government's case. So take it up, take it back down. They're trying to get certain bits of evidence thrown out. They're trying to bolster up a bunch of these arguments that Maxwell did not get a fair trial because of all of these problems that the government is responsible for. So they're, they're sort of manufacturing situations where they can really make the government look bad and like the government is failing to deliver on its promise of providing all defendants with due process. And if that's the case, then you know now there's, there's good arguments that the charges should ultimately be dismissed because they can't, they can't prove their case beyond a reasonable doubt. So, you know, it's not one of these things that's like a technical, like this is not a technical procedural violation. I, that's not, that's not accurate, right? It is, it is actually a procedural, it's a procedural issue because if she's not being cared for appropriately, then that's undermining her, her rights to a fair trial. So I, so I guess I kind of walk that back a little bit. Yeah, I mean, maybe, maybe dismissals on procedural violations, but I think it's more about laying a framework for, sort of a future appeals, you know, the, the probability of success on a dismissal is probably 0%, right? I, I really do not think that the, the government is going to dismiss this case at all, ever. Uh, they can't because there's just too much political baggage associated to it. So it's either going to be, you know, negotiate 
procedural violations in exchange for a better plea deal, or it's to lay the framework for an appeal at the conclusion of a case in the event that she is convicted. Great question. We have underscore shade says the 27,000 papers are each all of the billionaires and politicians who she supplied girls to high money cases on all levels. No mercy. Yeah. So it's that not, not just 27,000, 2.7 million pages. It's a lot of billionaires and politicians, but we know there are a lot of those types of people out there who would probably love to work with her. We have Osak says, Rob, big fan. So do you think Maxwell is holding out for the same deal her boss got with witness protection? <laughs> Good question, Osak. I like how you just kind of squeezed in there in, in the premise of that question, just a massive conspiracy theory. You sort of uh, uh, thinking past the sale. So do you think she's holding out for the same deal? What deal? Oh, you know, the witness protection deal that Epstein got. <laughs> well done. Very well done. Um, yeah, probably. Uh, why wouldn't you? That's a good deal. It's a good deal. Where, where is that guy? Costa Rica right now? Just, you know, doing whatever he's doing. <laughs> All right. We got Norovira says, Faith, have you been keeping up with your conspiracy theories? You should duck, duck, go. What an eye bruise means on a public persona involved with underaged children. I believe it means that she's marked for execution. She probably killed some of the children. What? What, Nora? Noro, norovirus. <laughs> All right. Well, you heard it. You heard it, folks. You know, there is a weird conspiracy about that. Now that you mention it, I remember seeing that. Isn't there a picture? I think of like all of the senators with a bruise on their eyes and like broken knuckles. I think I saw that on Twitter. It was like Mitch McConnell, Mitt Romney, Rubio or, or some. There's a there's a picture of that floating around. They've all got like bruised eyes, like bruised right eyes. Like what kind of weird, bizarre ceremony are they in? Anki Wo says it is a complicated case because Galen's lawyers are not just working for her, but by proxy also working for various princes, former heads of state and other famous people. The warden is checking every 15 minutes to make sure she doesn't kill herself while Galen isn't really trying to sleep anyway because she has to make sure she doesn't get killed while sleeping. Oh uh, yeah, that sounds like uh, like a living hell, doesn't it? <clears throat> but but yeah, there's a lot there's a lot of power behind her case, and it shows in the court documents. And I mean that. I mean it's very very impressive. There is a lot of activity going on, and it's just not it's not in proportion to the nature of the charges. Two point seven million pages pages of paper for four victims on a sex trafficking case. Give me a break. Jeremy Matrita says it would be a shame if the government botches Maxine's care enough to force the court to allow her to go home and then she disappears without punishment. It would be a shame, wouldn't it, Jeremy? You're exactly right. It would be a shame. It would be a shame if anything happened to her, right? It's a real damn shame that that something happened to Epstein. It would be a really, really big shame if something happened to Maxwell. We'll see what happens on this one. Chairman of board says, is it just me or when it comes to Glenn Maxwell, shouldn't the goal to be to get information about what went on and who was involved more so than to just hold her accountable for her part? I mean, seriously, I'd be okay with her walking if she spills everything on everyone that was involved. <laughs> so would I. Uh, so would I, right? As long as it went to the bigger fish. Okay, you know, as long as you got something out of it, right? What what Galen did to those four women allegedly, right, is not okay, and she shouldn't, you know, walk away from that. That's not what I'm saying. But if if you know if if Galen says, if a prosecutor says, all right, Galen, what do you got? She comes back and she says, all right, here's, I'm ready to make a deal. She goes, all right, all right, we got Hillary Clinton, Bill Clinton, we've got Bill Gates, we've got <laughs> we've got everybody, and she just rolls down the list, and you just go, hmm everything she goes everything all right all right i'll draft it up i'll sign it i'll sign it right here total immunity whatever you want tell us everything Th that's just having fun you know you know that's just having fun uh john delar 52 says if they find out joe biden or hunter biden were on the island they could they would find a way of dismissing the case and then she would go missing the media would ignore it well, wasn't Bill Clinton on that island? I mean, there's a picture of him. He's denied it unequivocally or uh, unequivocally ever since. But he's there's pictures of that. And I think isn't he on the flight logs with like Chris Tucker and Jackie Chan? Or I think that's that movie that I love. Wrote uh, Rush Hour. Great movie. All right. So good questions. Thank you for those over from watching the watchers dot locals dot com. And for the last segment on this little Friday, we have something kind of different. I want to try this out. See how this works. So. 
want to play a game with you, those of you in the live chat. Let's see if I can turn this on and uh, bring this up a little bit. So we'll, we'll scroll that up. This is over on YouTube on our live chat. So I've got a story that I want to share and I want to see if I can see if you can guess what this item is. So let's try this. So I want to show you this story over here. You can see myself down here in the bottom. This story comes over from the smoking gun and it says inmate who hid a blank in her V word gets 10 years. Okay. So we got to be careful here. A little bit of a content warning because we're talking about female genitals because this is a prison smuggling case. Okay. The question is, what did she bring in? What did she smuggle? What was the illegal contraband that got brought into this prison facility? She's getting 10 years in custody for it. Okay. Normally when you think about this stuff, what well, it's drugs, right? It's drugs. It's gotta be drugs. It's drugs, bringing drugs into prison. We all know how this goes. Let's read the story and see if you can fill in the blanks. What is it? All right, so here we've got it. It says, a Missouri woman has been sentenced to 10 years in prison after pleading guilty to smuggling a blank that was hidden in her vagina into the county jail, court records show. During a circuit court hearing last week, Amy White, Will Height, 39, cop to defel felony indictment, charging her with the delivery or concealment of the what? Of the blank. So this is her right here. We have Amy Wilhite. In a plea deal, Wilhite, seen at the right, was sentenced to serve a decade in custody of the Missouri Department of Corrections. She is currently being held at the Women's Eastern Reception Center, a state intake facility. Wilhite, who has previously done stretches in state prison, was arrested on February 14th on gun and narcotics charges and booked into the Boone County Jail. So do we, uh, we have any thoughts on what it is? All right. Let's take a look. It says here, an initial search of Will Height by Columbia police officers failed to locate the 4.6 ounce blank. So this thing was 4.6 ounces. What could that be? Stashed in her body orifice. A pat search at the jail was followed by a strip search, neither of which detected the four inch blank. What is it? Four inch blank. Let's take a quick look. We've got cell phone. Uh, Gabriel Prieto de Paula says it's a baby. Uh, it's a jewel vape. It's a keg. It's a missile launcher. It's a missile launcher is a good one. We have beer. K bean says it's beer. We have QS says it's a knife. We have taser, taser, taser. We got a nail file. Zorro says it's a nail file. So you could work your way out of it. Uh, the D Bailey says it's Hunter's crack pipe. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> Uh, K Bean says makeup and eggplant. That's a good one. Could be an eggplant. Uh, adrenochrome. We got somebody. I see it. I've seen a couple of it now. A husband's a CEO. He said a phone. A Hunter Biden might be in there. You never know. We got a couple people. There it is. It's coming out. That's right, folks. Let's take a quick look at what this is. Let's turn the chat off here. And I want to show you the image of what this woman brought into jail a 10 inch, no, a, a four inch, 4.6 ounce gun, 22 caliber revolver. My friends, this is a small 22 caliber revolver. Look at this little fella. That's four inches there. Looks like a small four inches maybe, but four inches, 4.6 ounces. Looks just right here. This is a North American arms brand revolver. 17 days before jailers discovered this gun. So she brought the gun in and, uh, you know, took it out and had it for 17 days, a 22 caliber revolver. <laughs> so uh, in a probable cause statement, investigators said that she removed the firearm from her body and concealed it within her personal belongings. During the questioning at the jail, she admitted it, but said that she was holding it for another female. She was in possession of the firearm stated that, uh, investigators reported. All right. So 10 years for that, in addition to some other charges. So, okay, well, that's it for me, everybody. Oh, we got to say hello to our new subscribers over on locals.com. And those are Bjorn underscore free. Welcome to you, my friend. We have Jim Mueller and we have rich underscore Brown 
all signed up to support the show at watchingthewatchers.locals.com. Thank you so much for uh, for supporting us. It's really it's really an amazing thing that you're helping us to build a separate platform, and it really keeps us motivated and grinding on. So I mean it. Thank you so much for it. We also want to say thank you to all of those of you who ask great comments. You know who you are. You're on the board, as well as everybody else who is a part of our Locals community. I want to thank all of our supporters. We've got Sleeper38 in the house. We have Ash Digger. We have Lil TLC. We've got Pepperoni. We have uh, Robin. We have HLB. Rags is in the house. Mr. Zeus, Deep State. We have Spoila, JR4, SJ Wariner. We got J-Bone in the house, 86. We've got U- Yuva Horva. We have Flag Drop and J, Robert Barnes, What's Up, Gus Click, Tim MCD, C The Veil, Toots Magoots, Dr. EMB, and Mr. Swift, DD123, Larry Light, Moleface, Lady, Lady Ali, Ryan, Chairman of Board, Defusco, and Takahari Seji are all in the house. Thank you all so much. Seriously, thank you so much for helping us to create our community at Locals. It's called at watchingthewatchers.locals.com. And if you go on over there and sign up, you can grab a copy of all of this stuff. It's available there, right there for you. Free free copy of my book. It's called Beginning to Winning. You can download the PDF there or buy it on Amazon. All of the slides that we went through are also available for you to download, including a copy of my impeachment party template, my existence system template, is available as well. This is what it looks like. If you want to sign up for the course, you can buy the full course. It's at existencesystems.com or at robertgruler.com. The other thing that you can do, of course, on Locals is share links throughout the day, leave comments, and meet great people who also want to have productive conversations about America and about sort of living our lives to the fullest. So that's the place to do it, watchingthewatchers.locals.com. And I really appreciate it when you go over there and support the program. What else? Anything else? Oh, yeah. I'm a criminal defense lawyer here at the R&R Law Group. We love to help good people who've been charged with crimes find safety, clarity, and hope in their cases and their lives. So if you happen to know anybody in the state of Arizona who has been charged with a crime, we would be honored and humbled if you trusted us enough to send them our direction. We'll make sure we take very good care of them. We can help with anything. Things like domestic violence, drugs, DUI cases, misdemeanor cases, felony cases. We handle it all. We can help restore rights, so uh, right to possess a firearm again, right to vote, right to apply for some federal benefits. There's a lot that we can do to help sort of, you know, patch together some of the things that may have gone off a little bit astray in prior years. We've all been there. There's nothing to be ashamed of. It's just something that sometimes we need some help from other people, and we're passionate about that. So if you need help or know anybody that does, we would be really humbled if you sent them our direction. We offer free case evaluations. We'd love to speak with them. And so sent them our way. We'll make sure that they leave our office better than they found us. And my friends, that is it from me. We are going to be back same time, same place next week. It's going to be at 4 p.m. Arizona time, which is Pacific time, 5 p.m. Mountain, 6 p.m. Central, 7 p.m. on the East Coast. Everybody, thank you so much for being here. Had a fun week with you all. I want to wish you a very nice resting, recovery-filled weekend. Eat lots of good food. Relax a lot. Unplug from politics a little bit because we're going to get right back into it on Monday. Everybody, thanks once again. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye.